Hello and welcome to the Claw Studio here at the Royal Opera House and this insight for interna celebrating International Women's Day. I'm Brenda Rimanis, I'm a broadcaster and I'm also chair of the Board of Trustees for Sir Matthew Bourne's New Adventures. This insight is taking place on International Women's Day, so we decided to take the opportunity to look at the perception and reality of the ballerina. To help us understand what life is like for a dancer and to pull it into historical context, I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by our esteemed guests. Firstly, we have Dame Monica Mason, former Royal Ballet Principal and former Director of the Royal Ballet. We have Sarah Lamb, current Principal here at the Royal Ballet. Jane Pritchard, Curator at the v &A Museum. And last, and by no means least, Uma Uzma Hamad, who's a dramaturg for the ballets by Wayne McGregor, which include um, Rural Wolf Works and The Dante Project. <laughs> Thank you all very much for joining us. Jane, can I start with you? That we have behind us, I hope, or soon. We, we, we have this perception, for example, of what a traditional ballet dancer is. It, we, ha like we have the wonderful Sarah right behind us in, this, in, in her role as a sugar plum fairy. Now with this perception, and I remember it as a child, it was this all feminine and delicate and tutus and, and it, what every young girl does aspire to be. But Sarah, put it in context for us. Can you contextualize what we mean by the ballerina and when the concept of the ballerina came to play? Yeah, I think it's uh, interesting that uh, the idea of the ballerina, it's so sort of cliché and in fact, I mean, wonderful photograph, but um, it is exactly what people would probably sort of conjure up. You know, you can imagine an editor saying, I want a photograph of a ballerina. How about um, pink tutu, sparkling, um, point shoes, um, all those sort of things. Uh, and that's how it has become to be understood but I think there's a great deal more to it and I think actually ballerina is a much used, misused term. It's, it's hard to know but apparently in the um, 18th century uh, sometimes the ballet master, the dancing teacher was referred to as a ballerino uh, and from that we then started calling the women ballerinas. I think there have been sort of different concepts over time uh, but I think when you start thinking of going back to the 18th century, um, you wouldn't have a tutu because tutus really develop in the 19th century. You certainly wouldn't have had point shoes. Likewise, they develop in the 19th century. Um, and so, so I think perception is something, that, um, is something that we're sort of left with. But the idea of, of uh, a ballerina, um, I think going back to the 1980s, uh, the critics Clement Crisp, and Mary Clark wrote a book called The Ballerina. This coincided actually with the television series, the BBC series, that was fronted by Natalia Makarova. And it was in a way a response to a previous television series, The Dancer. And so it was looking at really the peak of male and female uh, ballet dancers. And I know in the introduction, and I think it was probably Clement because it was very vividly written, to say that it was a gross um, miscarriage uh, to use the word ballerina for anybody, any young child who puts on a tutu, um, any member of a, a com dance company, female member of a dance company. Um, OK, a ballerina is usually referred to as, as female, but let's remember the trocks. Um, so it can be sort of gender bending too. Um, but essentially, I would agree with Clark and Crisp that the ballerina was the rare individual who is a superb dancer, but also has something more some sort of stellar quality, something that's probably indefinable, uh, that makes her stand out whenever she performs. Um, so I think it's, to me, it's absolutely a ballerina is the apex of the ballet profession. And I'm pleased to say there are definitely two on stage here now. You said it very nicely, because <laughs> if you look up the, 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 
the term itself. It, it says it's used to denote a well-trained and highly accomplished female classical ballet dancer. It is a critical acc accolade that signifies exceptional talent and accomplishment. And I think it does brilliantly describe <laughs> our guest this evening. Now, Monica, you joined the Royal Ballet in 1958. Can you tell us your memories of joining the company at that time and what it was like to be a ballerina at that time? Well, um, personally, I, I don't think I ever aspired to be a ballerina because as a child, I never had the chance to see any ballet. Uh, I never saw a company um, n n until I was about 13 uh, when I saw the Saddlerswell Theatre Ballet came to South Africa on a tour. But they brought with them a wonderful program of triple bills, one act ballets and none of them were in tutus. So I'd really? never really seen a tutu until I joined the, the Royal Ballet, and I suppose I was on stage in The Sleeping Beauty. I'd never seen the ballet, The Sleeping Beauty, until I was in it. And of course, the, the ballerina who was par excellence was Margot Fontaine. And of course, that was my first time of actually thinking Oh yes, now this now I know what they're talking about. This really is a ballerina, and she was uh, Margot was uh, so extraordinary because she had the most perfect proportions, and th the most perfect shaped head, and in those days it was felt that the most alluring look was to have dark hair. So and of course that's changed hugely. I mean. Sarah is a glorious ballerina with blonde hair. Um, <laughs> and thank goodness, you know, they didn't stick to the rules. But I think that, uh, you know, I think that you need a role model. And that's why I didn't have any role models as a child. I just wanted to dance. And, and that's what I aspired to do. I wanted to be a dancer. And I wanted to be able to earn my living as a dancer. Um, only later on, when I moved up the ladder a little bit, did I begin to think of myself maybe as becoming a ballerina? But, you know, life was very diff different 60 plus years ago because when I joined the Royal Ballet, there was a tremendous hierarchy and, and uh, ballerinas, the top line of principal dancers, you know, we gazed up at them like different creatures and uh, we didn't mix, you know, we didn't change in the same changing rooms or so they were separate from us. So I guess that lent a kind of magic too. Um, but everything about 60 years ago was, was very different. And did your essence of being a ballerina change as you moved up the ranks? Did you feel different about it? Did you feel a different kind of pressure? I, I think that one of the most ballerina things that, that a, a principal dancer can dance for me is, was when I put on the white tutu for the second act of Swan Lake. That was when I really thought, oh yes, now, now you'd better deliver, because this costume is so beautiful, and the feathers in your hair and, and everything, uh, you just feel so different. It's, it's, it's very different from wearing an all over or a, a very modern costume of some sort. Suddenly, when you're dressed like that, and you're going to be Odette, the white swan. That's when I think, you know, you think this is it now. Now I'd better deliver. Amazing. Now, I, the one thing I've consistently admired about dance and, and seeing dance is not just the beauty and aesthetic of it, it's the sheer athleticism of the dancers themselves. And you just know mm -hmm. that it must take a tremendous amount of work. Just how hard and difficult and relentless was it to train? Well, the word is relentless. I mean, you, you want to do it so much and you want to try to do it every day. Um, growing up in Johannesburg, I was not in a position to do, to work every day. Um, but when I came to England and went to the Royal Ballet School, that was the first time I actually danced every day. So I, I was then 15. So, um, and that was an eye opener. I mean, it was completely wonderful. And then I never wanted it to be any other way. And, uh, and it is, I think people, you know, when people come here and they watch a study day or an insight evening 
and they see people doing class or people rehearsing, I think it's an eye-opener because you don't realise. It's the same, you know, for a violinist or a pianist. It's hour after hour after hour after hour. And I think with dancers, um, you know, you have... You do class every day, and there are those... the rules of class, and that sets the boundary. That's, that's the discipline of it. And you have to try to measure up to it every day. And some days, you know, for some reason, you're better than other days, and you don't really know why, but some days even class is easier than on another occasion. But it's, you know, that's your, it's your security blanket too. It's the way you know yourself. You just get up every morning and you just go to class because that's what you do. So, Sarah, you've heard Monica's stories. You joined the Royal Ballet in 2004. You're an absolute joy and it's like what, being hypnotic when you watch you dance. But how much of what Monica says resonates with you in terms of her experience? Um, well, obviously, the society had changed drastically by the time the new millennium had started um, in many multiple ways. I think most obvious within the company probably was the hierarchy was not as strong, but it still had more strength than when I joined um, than I would say currently. I think the principal dancers are much more likely to be friendly and to be approachable and to know other company members' names. When I joined, there were a few principals who I wouldn't really dare go up to. And, and for the most part, people were quite unfriendly, actually. It was a very big change from my original company in the United States, which um, was incredibly friendly. And I think part of that is because there are just yearly contracts, so everyone is a, a little bit more, um, I guess, mutable in terms of where they might be ending up dancing next, so there's a little bit more urgency to make friends and to be kind. Um, and I think with a fixed contract and perhaps knowing most of the company being part of White Lodge or the Royal Ballet School, I suppose they knew each other, they didn't seem to need to say hello or how are you. So that was a big change when I joined. But um, uh, after hearing what Jane had said about ballerina, I, I actually didn't, even once I was promoted to principal, didn't consider myself a ballerina because that, I, I do agree, is something that is such a hallowed term. I'm not sure I rise up to it. I aspire to it and I, I work hard. I think part of that, maybe the je ne sais quoi, that is that sort of indescribable element is the, the focus that is innate and it won't be dependent on an audience, I think. I, and that type of work is something that can be in any discipline I enjoy basketball a lot, and right now there's just so many incredible players, but who's so good and what is that extra bit? And is it because they do a thousand free throws after a regular practice? You know, is it, what is it that makes them? And I, I think a lot of it is, it's a self-discipline that is regardless of any other determinant. Um, so it takes a certain psychology. I, I think so, and, and obviously that can have a, have a tipping point, <laughs> um, but I I do think that uh, it's it's never being satisfied. There's always another mountain. <laughs> now, Isma, you had no aspirations of being a ballerina, I assume. But that you, and your your entry into dance is very very different. Tell us about the role of the dramaturg. So um, I guess I I mean in a way I did have those aspirations. I was. A, Total ba ballet girl. I had pictures of, you know, Margot Fontaine and Moira Shearer on my wall. So I went through that phase, definitely. Um, and uh, went through the phase of later on, perhaps realising that at that time, I'm talking, you know, I grew up in the 1970s and 80s when I was a, a young girl and a teenager, kind of realising that perhaps there wasn't space in ballet for, for people of an Asian background. So perhaps I'd better do something else. I felt um, the same. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, but, but, but I come from a theatre background, really, so, so I had a company for, for many years which was about um, 
creating roles for people of South Asian background, but also because I had a lot of dance training and I trained in Kathak dance, which is also a classical form. So I'm sort of very well aware of kind of the rigors of, um, you know, the ballet training and what is required of a classical dancer. And so I certainly didn't have any kind of illusion that these were sort of fragile, fragile creatures, but these were incredibly um, hardworking, highly disciplined virtuosic artists. Um, and um, I guess my, um, my university degree is in modern languages, so there's always been that interest in um, translating, um, uh, whether that's between languages or, or languages like from, from literature to dance, like we did with Wolfworks or the Dantec project. Um, and the role of the dramaturg for me is as a, as a creative collaborator, so really working alongside the choreographer to try and work out when you're approaching a, a new ballet and there are so many directions that you can go in and there's such a plethora of rich source material, um, what's actually going to go in? You know, what, what, themes, what themes are you going to address? Are there going to be particular characters in it? Um, what are the ideas that are going to shape it and what's it going to look like? So it's a, it's a kind of a, a creative conversation from the beginning. Um, is it more with the choreographer than with the dancers themselves? Or do you have an empathy and a relationship with the ballerina or the dancer? Could I, can I interject oh, quickly? Of so um, it was wonderful having Uzma for the Dante project because um, I'm sure whoever has tried to read it, it's a, a tome and it's uh, very in daunting to think how does this get transcribed without words and I played, I portrayed Beatrice, and what was fantastic about the way that Uzma was describing and involving us in her, tra you know, transliteration, I suppose, with Wayne onto, and we were specifically talking about the second part of Dante when he's leaving, he's in purgatory and he's leaving. Um, that was a, incredible for me to have her there and to be able to, um, I, well, we discussed how Beatrice is actually the first time that when Dante, he's been sort of following her his whole life and then into hell. He obviously doesn't see her and then he sees her in heaven, but she's the first being that admonishes him and in a way it made it for me I had a feeling of not just being this beautiful virginal sort of halo creature um, concept but actually being a human talking to another human and saying and insisting that the error of his ways uh, is recognized and realized and it was just wonderful to have Ozma there for that. So there's a contemporary choreographer, someone like Wayne, work, and the way he works very differently to, say, a Frederick Ashton or a Macmillan. Does it allow the dancer more agency? It sounds like you were more involved in the creation or the... I the feel that way, but Monica did, did, you, did you have Spring with Macmillan, so that was... Did you feel you had agency when you did Rise oh, of Spring? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I, I think that uh, when you're working with a... Most often, I think, when you're working with a choreographer, it's a very collaborative experience. Uh, you don't just stand still and wait to be instructed because the choreographer is constantly drawing things out of you so that, you know, sometimes you might have, he will suggest a movement. I mean, Wayne demonstrates a great deal. When Kenneth was young, of course, he also demonstrated. Later in his life, he didn't. But he still would describe what he wanted from you. And then, you know, you have to expose yourself in the, in the sense that you get up and try something. And it might feel very silly. But the choreographer will say, yes, that's exactly what I want. And you think, oh, wow, fabulous. Equally, they'll, you'll try something else and they'll say, Kenneth was, you know, very funny sometimes. He'd say, where do you think that movement's leading you? Show me where you want to go. So you would show a movement and he would say, no, that's awful. <laughs> <laughs> Is that quite soul-destroying? No, no, you know, because working, when you work so intimately with somebody who you respect so much, 
um, there's, it's such a wonderful, warm feeling. You, you would do anything for them. You know, if they say, you know, stand on your ear, you'd try because you want to please and, and you, you, you know you're building something together. Do you think the fact though, that um, ballet in particular is still quite patriarchal, that that, has, that kind of determines how we perceive the ballerina, how we see that there's a sort of their role and your, because I assume that particularly the big works and when and you have a star choreographer, that their input is more important, that you don't have as much agency, you're not, you're kind you know, of... You know, I never saw the ballet as patriarchal at all. Because, I mean, I joined a company that was being directed by Nanette de Valois, hmm. and the other remarkable woman directing Rombert was Madame Rombert. And, um, and the ballerina stands in front of the man. Yeah, I'm going to agree with Monica. <laughs> I, I joined, my first company was directed by Anna Marie Holmes, my second company by Dame Monica Mason. And I think Jane probably have some historical input here because I imagine that at, it, that at the time that ballet was being performed more and more, and especially on point, this was probably one of the only professions a woman could have, other than the oldest profession, <laughs> to be outside the home, in a way. What? I mean, performers were not very common, and all of a sudden you have the ballet, which is about the woman. They have the Sleeping Beauty, you have the Swan. I mean, this is much later, but the first ballets, maybe La Sophie or... Well, tonight is about breaking perceptions. I'm glad we're doing that because, <laughs> because th 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 from the outside, yeah. you, you, you had your, and we, we yeah. talked about the, the term prima, and you were very, you have particular um, opinions on the role prima, which we'll, we'll get to. But what's your opinion on this? Because the, the reality was, and I was going to come to that, there were some really strong women working in dance, like Ninet and, and the likes. I think, I think that we've got, we've got onto two wonderful points here. Yes, I mean, I, I always remember actually going to a session, probably something like this, um, that uh, Ninette de Valois was talking at. Uh, and she said that, well, she thought that women were terribly good at getting things going, but then they could hand it on to the men. Um, and I think that's true. I think there's, it's amazing how many women have been involved. And I think it has been a career um, that women can turn to. I think sometimes people forget the range of uh, elements within the theatre. And so, you know, as far as women go, it's not just performing. Um, wonderful designers, an amazing number of women choreographers. They may not get quite the profile, um, but yes, there are a lot of them. Uh, almost every area um, will be actually uh, full of women as well. Now, that wasn't, of course, always so true. Um, but certainly, I think that in terms of teachers, there have been a lot of very good women teachers. And many of those have then gone on to be choreographers. It doesn't necessarily follow. Um, but I think when one looks you know, back at the past, that's where you're going to sort of find um, sort of women. And I think Sarah's point about you know, this was a profession. Um, it's a difficult profession. Um, and in terms of when one looks sort of say at the um, 19th century, um, yes, the romantic ballet that's when the ballerina really sort of comes into focus. There have been sort of men dominating the stage, then the women come in. Largely, the choreography was by uh, men uh, for those ballerinas, but there were some women choreographers, um, and indeed some dancers also did choreography. Um, uh, and then one sort of sees at the beginning of the 20th century, really the return of the male dancer, and then you get actually, I think, a much more balanced situation mm. coming out of that. But the period in which you have sort of the large corps de ballet, of course, is the period when the companies were dominated by women. Mm. In terms of careers, many of them, of course, started very young. And indeed, there were many more child dancers in the past. Um, a big thing is made of the baby ballerinas um, in the second generation of ballet russe companies. But actually, there was nothing unusual about 14, 15 year olds um, having leading roles. It was a younger uh, society um, and the dancers, if they were going to rise to the top, would rise very quickly. Um, that was something that was very, very conspicuous. But a lot of the dancers would actually, when they joined uh, a ballet school, they would be being apprenticed. And so they would be performing while they were training. Um, mm -hmm. And yes, you had families. 
uh, working in, in dance, usually theatrical families, so different generations coming in. Um, so it was actually an area where there was, there could be a profession. Now, it may not have been a very respectable profession. Um, there was sort of confusion, and that was partly, I think, because of what they wore. They were rather more scantily dressed than many other people in society. And so that confused how they were perceived. Mm. I know that one of the things that I, that I, I minded um, after I'd been with the company for a, a year or two, and I actually expressed my opinion, because in those days you had to be a member of the union, you had to be a member of equity. And uh, little by little I realised that equity played a very important part because they were there to look after us and to, because uh, our working conditions were sort of haphazard, you know, there was no structure to the day, there was no uh, finish time for the end of the day. You finished when the, the ballet master or the choreographer felt like finishing. And because we used to rehearse in West London, half an hour away from the theatre here, we would have to travel up on the tube from Barons Court to Covent Garden. And sometimes we hadn't finished at Barons Court much before 5.30, quarter to six. The show, the curtain went up here at 7.30. So we sort of gobbled down a sandwich on the, on, on the tube on the way. And, um, and then we began to ask questions about, couldn't we have a proper finish time? that would allow us to travel up here and have something to eat before the show. And, and also the thing that struck me particularly, uh, once I'd, I had sort of secured my first contract after one year, I then felt a little bit more safe, although I, under Ninette de Valois, I don't think anybody ever felt safe. <laughs> but, but it was the fact that the men, the boys, as they were called then, we were called boys and girls in those days, and the boys, earned 10 shillings, which is 50p, a week more than the girls. And I remember thinking, this isn't on. You know, Swan Lake, we do four acts and they do two. And Sleeping Beauty, we do four acts and they do nothing like we do. And the same in Giselle. And I thought it was terribly unfair. And, you know, through equity, one began to, began to ask those questions. And actually, equal pay became quite a thing in the 60s. And, uh, and we achieved it. And, and what was interesting was that the, all the time, the guys didn't think it was right that they did get 50p more a week. They agreed. They, they, they thought that we should have, I thought we should have had more. <laughs> but I ne we never got that far. So is it very different now? Would, do you feel that, that dancers are more assertive in terms of demanding what they need and, and, and there's yeah. a greater duty of care? Yes, and I think um, even in the last few years, I think it's changed so much. I think the pandemic has changed a lot for everyone, and I think there is more um, there there is more conscientiousness about the stress of performing and the pressures of of being on stage all the time and yeah in, in exposing yourself in a way and especially having social media anyone can write whatever they want about you and many people will see it whereas before it was mm. a newspaper and then it was the fish and ship wrapping and that was it you know that it did there was a an ephemeral quality to performing which is lost now because things will be captured and they can last forever I just wanted to talk about the, the changing roles that are available. For example, it was working with Wayne McGregor, who has no, doesn't come from a ballet background. Do you think his sensitivities has, has, has been different? Do you think he's kind of allowed for a different narrative and a different role for a ballet, ballet dancer, which we're seeing ever evolving? Um, I mean, definitely, Wayne is an incredible intelligence, not just in terms of movement. He has an incredibly sophisticated understanding of. Um, you know, what the human body can do, and also an incredible curiosity about what it means to be in this kind of embodied physical existence. And of course, the dancer is the sort of ultimate exemplar of, of that and what, what the embodied intelligence can be. Um, but he's also somebody who has a huge range of interests from, you know, kind of science to technology to literature to art, you name it. Um, so I think. With, with Wayne's work, he's, he's kind of less interested in 
the, the sort of iconic idea of the ballerina and more interested in how these amazing artists can help to create new stories and new works and how um, all that technique and all that virtuosity can be used to communicate these new ideas. Jane, do you think there was any other um, developments, particularly around the 50s and 60s, that sort of led to this evolution, in, in, if, you, if you like, that, had, that made a significant difference? Well, I think, actually, when you sort of look at the early 50s, I think that was a very important time in terms of the subject matter of ballets, that there was the move away from sort of the fantasy uh, to a much grittier, more realistic... Uh, presentation. I think there's a number of choreographers who were sort of very much involved with that. I think one can start well, obviously with someone like the, the French choreographer Roland Petit, who I think actually late 40s, 50s is very influential. Uh, and in Britain, you've got choreographers, not only Kenneth Macmillan, but also people like Peter Darrell. And they were exploring, I think, contemporary society in a way that hadn't happened before. Um, and so when sort of Kenneth McMillan goes on to do works like The Invitation and put rape on stage, now it was more shocking because it was at the Opera House than it would have been in a regional theatre perhaps, but there was that sense that in the, the 50s and 60s, subject matter expanded and how you could um, sort of use your dancers to tell those stories. So how you would tell those stories through movement, I think actually brings a very considerable change to the world of ballet. So if we take something like Anastasia, um, I think we may have an image of it um, some, uh, with Natalia Osipova playing mm -hmm. Anastasia much later than it was created. What does that say about the sort of role? Do you think that's indicative of what you were saying? Because that role was much more visceral. They were looking at mental health. I think, it, I think it's extraordinary to, to sort of think, but also to remember that that final act was the, the starting point for the work. So that sort of um, questioning as to wh whether this is... Uh, tormented character was Anastasia or Anna Anderson, um, all those sort of qualities. It's not, you know, your sort of fairy tale situation. It's not your mythic situation. It's drawing on history. Now, history had been used before, but I think that, again, the grittiness that comes through. And I think it's quite interesting that, that you know, this is sort of then created and then within an opera house setting is actually the first two acts are added to it. Again, based on history, but in a way much prettier, um, but setting up the scene so that people will have a real background for it. So um, how do you feel about, Sarah, the, the, the difference between doing a heritage role and doing a, a more modern production? I, what, I, what I found really fascinating is when they said when they're promoting a production, for example, if the, if the, the image has a tutu, it seems to get more likes or more ticks on social media, which almost implies that we still have this romantic notion that we want to hold on to what a ballerina is and what a do what the dancer is. But as a performer, it's, how do you feel about it? What do, what do you... Do you get, have a different challenge? Is there a different stimuli for you in doing those? Yeah, I, absolutely it's a different challenge. It, the classical repertoire is still the Mount Everest, I suppose, in terms of your performance because no matter how much one trains I think no one will ever feel as though they've done a perfect performance and it is I'm not saying that that happens when you're on stage in a contemporary work but there's something freeing about knowing no one's seen it before and you're the one doing it and then that's the beginning of it that, that there's a wonderful feeling of uh, comfort to come from that, or I suppose just uh, maybe assurance. Whereas when you go into a, <clears throat> a role that's been made famous by countless incredible ballerinas, there is absolutely a daunting history that has preceded you. Did you feel that daunting mm. history when, when you oh, took yes. to the stage, Monica? I think that um, especially in a company with a tradition of the classics, um, you know, when you take on a role like the Swan Queen or Aurora, you know, you know very well who's gone before you. And I think the person that we measured ourselves against always was Margot, because somehow she, you know, people idolised her, and she, she was uniquely special. Um, 
she represented everything that a ballerina should look like in our imagination. I mean, I, I'm not surprised that, you know, on, on social media they, you get all the likes for people, in, for girls in tutus, because it's what, it's, it's how people understand ballet. And I think that's why it's so wonderful. I know, uh, speaking to people who came to the Dante Project, who said afterwards, I had no idea dance could be like this. I had no idea that dance could express things like this. And of course, as a dancer, you feel that yourself because um, I think sometimes though, being able to perform in more realistic roles like Anastasia or uh, it, they feed across in, into the classics because you can, you know, you, you, you need to bring something very human uh, to the classics. You, if you're being Giselle, you need to communicate to the audience exactly who this young girl is. And, you, and it is possible, amazingly, <coughs> because that's the amazing thing about the theater, is that you can tell a story across the footlights and people will understand exactly what she's like, that she's young, she's probably a, a little what we would call neurotic or highly strung, um, is that she is very impressionable. Um, she believes the moment she meets this wonderful young man that this is the love of her life. You, you convey those things. And of course, the more human and real you make those people, the more the audience is engaged with those performances. And I think that's why it's wonderful as a dancer to have the opportunity to dance, to dance a range of roles because everything feeds into everything else. And you just, you grow as a dancer, as an artist. And, and I think to be limited to one kind of work all the time, I think, I can't imagine that, you know, having danced across a very broad repertoire and, and loving everything, uh, you know, so many different choreographers. Well, we talked about um, the, the, the role of a contemporary um, choreographer like Wayne, and I know um, from observation watching Matthew Bourne work as well, he's very into making the dancer feel that they're a part of the crew. There is this co-creation taking part. They're two male choreographers. You've worked with some female choreographers as well. Is there a sort of, a, a, a sort of feminine sensibility which is slightly different or that you can put your finger on? I think it's really difficult to put your finger on it. I, instinctively, I think there must be because we inhabit different bodies and therefore there must be a feminine dance. I think it's one of those things like the idea of a feminine writing that is possibly less important to pin it down than it is to keep asking that question because I think when you keep asking that question, you are challenging the old tropes, you're challenging the assumptions that perhaps there are around making dance. And every time you're coming up with an interpretation, you're thinking, hang on a minute, is this, is this something that's inherited? It's very useful to continue asking, is there a feminine aesthetic? Is there a feminine way of working? Because in some ways, it's similar to asking, is there an alternative way of working? If women are the other, is there a different way of working that is more feminine? Um, I think I, I worked with Cathy Marston on, on the Ballet Victoria, which was about Queen Victoria. Um, and actually we had one of our rehearsal process took in International Women's Day and it was a very interesting ballet to be working on because not only was it about this iconic queen and woman, um, our interpretation was about mothers and daughters and about <clears throat> the way in which Victoria had co-opted her youngest daughter, Princess Beatrice, to kind of, you know, be her, the person who looks after her in her old age and, and what that meant for Beatrice. And while we were having, while we were making the work, Kathy and I are also both mothers and daughters, and you know she had she has an elderly mother, and so do I. And we had so many deep conversations about what you know what it means to be a woman working, as Victoria was also working. Um, so I think there were a lot of there was a lot of sort of feminine um, conversation, if you like, that went into the making of that ballet. But then again, you know I've talked to another fantastic choreographer, Pam Tanovitz, about it, and asking her, you know, how do you feel about is there, is there such a thing as a feminine dance? Is there a feminine choreography? And she'll say, well, again, she'll say, I think, I think there must be, but my work is always compared to men. She says, you know, my work is compared to sort of modern dance male choreographers, Jerome Robbins, Merce Cunningham. Um, 
So it's very hard to pin it down, and it, it's, it's not something that we can really helpfully generalize about, but I think it's a really, really good and on-point question to keep asking. Well, look behind us. We look at um, the image there. It's very different. I think this was that Crystal Pike's work. Um, it's very fearful. It's very a assertive. That's changing for, for sure. That's, that's not a, a pink tutu and a steeping beauty at all. What's also changing and, and has been interesting to evolve is what a ballerina looks like, who, who can be a ballerina. And I remember, it must have been 20, 25 years ago, I was friends with Brenda Edwards, who was a, one of the first black ballet awesome. dancers I'd ever known, I didn't really had ever come across. And I remember sitting, watching her perform, and it was just like beyond imagination for me and so exciting to see. And it was about oh, at least 15, 20 years later before I started consistently seeing a diversity of dancers that were ballet dancers. Can you talk to us about how you've seen that change? Let's use, for example, Ballet Black as an example, how they've kind of changed the conversation around what ballet is, what black ballet dancers are, and also what, what um, the, the um, director has done in terms of moving the, the whole conversation about dance along. Yeah, I mean, it's a really important conversation to have when we start talking about, you know, who is the ballerina? What does the ballerina look like? When we say the word ballerina, what image does it conjure up? You know, in the same way as we have so many conversations now with young children in schools about when we say the word scientist, does it conjure up a man in a lab coat? Um, when we say the word ballerina, does it, does it conjure up the image of a white dancer, perhaps? And I think that people like Casa Pancho uh, from Ballet Back have been incredibly important and powerful in moving that conversation forward. Um, but these people have always been around. If we think about somebody like Catherine um, Dunham as well, or Virginia Johnson, um, these people who, be just because of the colour of their skin, not only had to be dancers, but also had to be activists, were automatically became activists and became people who are changing the conversation. Um, and I think we're having a lot of conversation here in the Opera House and in, in, in the Royal Ballet about diversity. Sarah is on the diversity and inclusion group, I know, and I, I've, I've been invited to speak to them as well. And I think... <laughs> I mean, it's a really interesting time. I think it's also important that while we have companies like Ballet Black, that they're not seen as then absolving the other big companies of their responsibility to be more diverse and to, uh, and to make sure that in terms of the creation of works, we also have um, people from diverse backgrounds in the room. So it's not always that you are there to convey you know, a different experience, but it's just that by virtue of who you are, you will bring some of that with you. So I think it's, it's really important now that we find that balance that in honouring other cultural traditions, we don't all also put people back in those pigeonholes which we've spent years and years trying to get out of. There is, there is quite a challenge, isn't there, moving things on? Um, Monica, you can answer this, or, or Jane, because you do want to hold on. The Royal Ballet has a legacy and a, and a reputation which is important and, and we want to go on, but they're do also doing great works in terms of moving things on and having those conversations. Mm. Do you think, and also when I watched, when you went to see Swan Lake on Friday and you look at the core and just how tight they are and how everybody has to look the same or it's distracting, it is quite a challenge for a, a company like this, isn't it? You know, I've never thought that it would be any problem at all to have a, a mix of colours of people in the corps de ballet, for instance. And I know when I was directing and people used to ask me this question all the time and I, I said, you know, it's not an issue for me. Uh, it really isn't. I think what is wonderful about Ballet Black is that it actually succeeded in getting other than pink point shoes on the stage because um, Ballet Black used to have to, the girls there used to have to make their point shoes brown mm. to match their skin. And now Freed's are actually producing point shoes that are the right colour for people of colour. Um, I think that, you know, it's... You consider where ballet was performed originally in Italy, France, Denmark, in, in predominantly white um, populations. Um, but, you know, we're not, we're not at that time, 19th century now, we're here and now. And I think that, I think great strides are being made. It's slow, but there's, there's nothing to stop people. I think, you know, when I go to see Ballet Black, I love it because the audience is mostly brown and black people. 
And I just think how wonderful. They're, they're here and they support the company so brilliantly. And I think what Cass has achieved is extraordinary. Um, but I, you know, I think it'll, it'll, keep going, it'll keep going on. But it doesn't happen like that. Mm -hmm. It she's, really she's doesn't. Done, she has done more than just, you know, put black ballet dancers on the stage. And she, in terms of the, the, the repertoire and what smaller companies can do, she's also commended for that kind of work as well, is she not, Asma? Mm. I think as, as much as it is about, you know, the, the, the amazing developments about you know, you know, ballet shoes and so on, it's also about the stories that are told. Um, and I think that's where these companies have been incredibly instrumental. But there's literally no reason why we can't do that here as well and we yeah. are we are doing that yeah, here um, yeah. it, I think sometimes people feel when we start talking about heritage works I think sometimes people feel a little bit threatened around that and that perhaps um, you know they want to preserve the status quo I'm talking about perhaps older audiences sometimes um, I think from my point of view, when we're talking about classical repertoire, we need to always remember that tradition is a continuum. There is no such thing as a, as a tradition that stayed still and is a monolith. It's mm -hmm. always evolving in response to, to the time. Mm -hmm. um, and that when we're talking as a dramaturg particularly, we, we always need to be asking that conversation of why are we doing this work now? Um, how is it relevant to modern audiences? That doesn't mean that you can't you know, put on a work that is set in the past. But I think you need to be aware of what our relationship is to that past. So, for example, when we made Victoria, to, to come back to that example again, um, we were very clear that we didn't want to make a romantic ballet about the Victorian Albert story. We, we felt we had to be very responsible from this vantage point of 200 years of looking at you know, Victoria's legacy, the legacy of empire, and, and bringing some of our um, that lens to it so that we are also seeking to say something about society now. Um, we're also seeking to inform, not just to celebrate. The other thing worth celebrating also is the duration with which a dancer can continue their, their careers, partly because there's so much attention to duty of care and making sure that the dancer is looked after while they're on stage and also afterwards. Mm -hmm. That must surely be significant. When you look at the Alessandra Fer Ferry, who I just think is absolutely amazing, and Sylvie Guillaume, they're all dancing much later than we'd anticipate. Yes, well, because they've been looked after. They've looked after themselves. They know how to look after themselves. And then there are these brilliant um, developments in the science of the body. And, and I think what is remarkable is how, you know, and it started with sport and so much of the, the, the science and the investigation that's gone into repairing footballers and cricketers and skiers has fed into the dance world. And, and so nowadays people can be repaired in ways that they couldn't in the past. I mean, you know, in the past, if you ruptured your Achilles tendon, that was the end of your career. And if you had a cruciate ligament go in your knee, that was the end of your career. And, and you know, I've seen so many careers wasted, people in their 20s um, wrecked, you know, and, and not being able to be fixed. So I think that those developments are, are hugely important. But I, I think everything, you know, understanding about diet. I mean, when I, when I was a young dancer, we weren't allowed to bring water into the studio. You weren't allowed to drink in the middle of a rehearsal. And if a rehearsal was three hours long, you were extremely thirsty at the end of it. But nobody was allowed to bring a drink into the room, just as you weren't allowed to talk. Nobody spoke in rehearsals. You sat around the side and there was no conversation. So you were utterly silent. You know, dancers also were expected not to be heard um, and not to have an opinion about anything very much. Um, you know, we've come a very long way. Yeah, we have, and we're coming to nearly the end of this conversation. And I think it would, we'd be doing ourselves a disservice if we didn't look at, when we're talking about changes and, and things that progress, it's looking at social media, because social media gives, I guess, for a dancer, gives you your voice, gives you a platform, gives you agency to, to define who you are yeah. on that particular platform. It also has the ability to be quite toxic. How do you personally deal so with this? Now is when you're going to regret having me on the panel. <laughs> I don't use social media. Uh, is that yeah. a conscious decision? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't have time for it. I just don't. I have a, a Facebook account, which I only had because 
I, someone had made one for me and people thought it was me and it wasn't me, so I had to become a friend of myself in order to <laughs> let people know that that was not me. No. So anyway, then, so I had that. <laughs> and then I, I used it a little <laughs> bit, but I, I honestly didn't feel like it was um, benefiting me in any way. And there are many things that I'd like to be doing in my free time. I love to read and I don't get that much free time. And I'd rather not be looking at the telephone. I do look at my telephone. I read the New York Times on it. I read the New Yorker. I read the Guardian. But I'm not, I'm not reading social media and I'm not on the other things. And uh, so my Facebook account, I think, has been inactive for about two and a half years or something. Um, so I probably still get messages on it, but I, I don't know the password, so I'm not on it, so don't send me a message. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I'm absolutely the wrong person to ask about this. And, um, but I do think part of that is self-preservation. I actually think it would probably be a distraction. I think it would start, I would start to spend time on it, thinking about something that really is insignificant. Um, and obviously I'm, I've been able to continue living without it, so it's possible. You've done it, yeah. and you're still brilliant. So, so I mean, I, I, you know, I, I luckily still being cast and doing roles on stage, so it's obviously not conditional on that. So, it, it, I mean, at one point, maybe it will be. I do understand that all of my comrades are on it, and they all feel the need to be exposing themselves and showing themselves in different metiers, and I do understand that, and I'm sure a lot of them get engagements to do galas through that medium, but um, I, I'm lucky that I'm at the type time in my career where I, I don't need to feel that pressure. If I were 20, then I probably would, and, yeah, I, and I really do have a lot of uh, sympathy for those younger dancers, because I don't think I don't think it's a good thing. And I, I'm, it's very unfortunate because I think there's some wonderful things about technology. I love being able to look up words. I love being able to find something out and usually from a reliable source. And oh, I think Wikipedia is an incredible thing for the most part, but a lot of other things that are um, at the fingertips of young children, of teenagers, of young adults, I don't think it's a good thing. I don't think it's helpful for them as a, in growth and development. I don't think it makes them critical thinkers. I don't think it enhances their education. I think they're not able to read the way that we read when we were younger. We didn't have this device that was sucking our attention all the time. I'm sorry, now this is a lecture. <laughs> no, I'm going to stop. You've just done a TED talk. Yeah. <laughs> so, Brenda, can I just add to, just slightly just play devil's yeah. advocate, and I completely hear you, and yeah. I have a son who's a bit wedded to his phone, and I'm always shouting at him to get on there, off there. But um, I just wanted to say one of the things that we also see with that rise in personal profile of the dancers on social media um, where the dancers now have these huge followings, um, is many dancers are taking ownership of that and using their platform for good. So, for example, around uh, Black Lives Matter, we had n a number of the dancers here who kind of posted about it, wrote, wrote poems, made films. Um, and so it's, it's a world away from what you were saying, Monica, mm. about kind of being seen and not heard, but mm. actually dancers really coming into their own as public figures and using that platform for good and recognizing you know, that, that all art is political and that they, as, as kind of virtuoso artists, have tremendous power to effect change. Well, I think also, you know, dancers were thought to be rather stupid people. Um, that was because we often finished school quite early and we, you know, f and we didn't think of ourselves as highly educated creatures. But, you know, dancers are very intelligent, cool. highly intelligent. You can't be a dancer if you're not clever. I think you've all proved that now. I'm going to have to move on to our <laughs> online um, questions. And the first one was to Uzma. Mm -hmm. It's about female representation in the industry as a dramaturg. OK. Um, right, OK, that's a really interesting that one. That is a so, TED Talk conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is a TED Talk conversation. So I'm just going to make two very quick points. Um, one is um, around dramaturgy. A lot of dramaturgs are women. Um, and I think, going back to that whole conversation about um, male-female power relationships. I think that is because often the dramaturg is that slightly receptive, um, sensitive role alongside the choreographer. Um, and so historically, a lot of those roles have been women. 
Historically, that role has been seen as a service. People talk about using dramaturgs. I think now things are changing. People are beginning to realize that these female dramaturgs are actually people with a lot of ideas who contribute to the making of the work and that they are full creative collaborators in the same way as a set designer is. So that's, that's one point. Um, the other point, of course, is around female choreographers. Um, as Jane has said, they've always been around, possibly had less profile, but I think now there is more of a push um, to getting those female choreographers through. And I think they've always been there in, in modern dance, I think is probably quite different from, from, from ballet in that sense, in that um, you know, there are so many big names, you know, Pina Bausch, um, Trisha Brown, all of these people who, who have, Martha Graham, Martha of course, Graham. who have kind of mm. made modern dance. Um, and I, I myself personally wonder whether there is something in that in that ballet tradition of being being very polite, being being good little girls, being seen and not heard, being lined up in rows and being identical, and I'm being controversial now, and Monica's going to tell me off mm. a minute. No. But um, whether there is something around that, as, as in the education system as well, we reward girls for being good little girls, and we're Quiet. given approval for getting the answer right and for doing what adults want us to do. Um, and I think moving forward, we need to be cultivating our young female dancers to be more disruptive, to um, preserve in themselves what is really, really essential, and to be able to to speak up and be and and be those creative forces, which which they absolutely are. I think Thank that you. there are more that they're discovering more and more that women can compose, and uh, I mean music. I mean, in the past, uh, there are, there there are so many stories of fabulous female composers, um, but who were then squashed because women were not supposed to be capable of doing that. I'm going to stop you on that comment and I'll, because a question has come in okay. from you from above. <laughs> is, is how would you say that technique has evolved and what's your opinion on it? How do you feel about it? Oh, has technique evolved? Technique has evolved. Like everything continues to evolve. Um, and, and I think it's by um, the, the wonders of choreography and, the, and, you know, for me, choreographers are king. I've always said that, and, but in the case of a female choreographer, <laughs> choreographer is a queen. Um, these, I think, that if it were not for choreographers, dance would have died, because it's only by developing um, a young person, challenging a young person, pushing the boundaries, seeing where it can go. I mean, it was, you know, the appointment of Wayne McGregor to the Royal Ballet as a uh, resident choreographer was seen by so many people at the time as really alarming and rather mad. And why would one possibly, why would you possibly want to do that? You know, I saw in this person uh, someone who was going to contribute to the Royal Ballet in the most magnificent way. I really kind of felt, you know, I used to look at this portrait on my office wall of Dame Ninette de Valois and talk to her often <laughs> and ask her what she thought. I mean, you know, she was a woman of such vision and of course I didn't compare myself in any way to her, but I was having to look after this wonderful group of dancers in this amazing theatre and, and to make sure that, that the, the dance was going to go on evolving. Otherwise, I, we didn't have a resident choreographer. I thought the whole thing could just fall flat like a pancake. And Wayne arrived on the scene and, you know, what he was immediately able to give in terms of creativity to the entire organization, the people that he brought in. So I think that's how technique evolves. And, and of course, the more fabulous people are in a Wayne McGregor ballet, then you'll see them dance in Swan Lake. I mean, the technical level now for people making their debut in Swan Lake, and I saw a debut last week, and I couldn't believe my eyes. The young girl, you know, simply sensational uh, uh, technique, technical ability. But part of that is, of course, because she's working in an atmosphere where the sky's the limit. I could listen to you forever, but time is, I can feel the time pressure on me. And we have a question coming for Sarah. How much individual, individuality do you think you can bring to a big famous role, like for example, Adet, when it's, there is well-established choreography? I think one still can bring quite a lot of individuality. Monica referenced to Giselle earlier, and it's interesting because I actually don't think of her as fragile. I think of her as having a heart condition 
but I, I don't think I'm within my acting range. I didn't see neurotic as being part of, of how I could convey her. So I, I felt she is just incredibly, um, in, incredibly honest. And so therefore she in, in intuits that everyone is honest. So her, her love is, is shattered by the realization that people lie. Yes. I mean, that's, that's her, her downfall. It's her vulnerability. So, so yeah. So, I mean, so we all have different interpretations, even of these classical roles. I mean, Aurora is more difficult because she's been given everything as a child, and so she's not really bad at anything. So how can you... <laughs> there's not a lot of humanity in that, of course, because in a way she's perfection and you know bordering on perfection whereas Odette Odile is so interesting to do because you everyone has their own story their own history and so how do I bring my ideas into that character how do I think about what would it be like to be trapped and that, Wayne's ballet Raven Girl was the first time that I really thought about I guess, a, a superbly different way of feeling about one's body in that this mm -hmm. woman, child, girl, felt like she should be a bird. Her mother had been a bird. And, to, and giving a little bit of empathy to having people feel that they are born in the wrong body. And I just wanted to mention also that I feel Wayne uses people humans as the artist they are I don't think he really I think as Kenneth created the role for Monica in Rite of Spring that had subsequently been danced by men I feel that some of Wayne's ballets could be interchangeably sexed mm -hmm. so I feel that that is something that could be the next step in some of his ballets as well um, because I feel like he really does use the, the artist and it's not necessarily a man or a woman. And I feel that, you know, the most profound connections that I have with people are often through art and not so much through um, a societal sexual lens, really. I feel like that is a different type of connection that we get to experience as dancers and that's one of the most enjoyable things about being a dancer because we touched on this earlier in our, in our off, off camera conversation about casting because there must be something individual about a dancer that means that they are given this particular role Uzma you had a comment to make on that I think I think definitely when the when the choreographer is casting that they are thinking of that dancer's particular quality not just their personality but their sort of movement signature that they can bring to that to that role and how they can then help create that role and I think I'm always impressed by how when the next dancer to dance that role comes along they have to kind of make it their own not just try and you know if Sarah's created the role just try and do a version of Sarah but to try and try and you know inhabit it themselves but I think you're absolutely right that um, Wayne sees humans and they, they may be male or female dancers but they're not being men with a capital M and women with a capital W and mm. um, Wolf Works 2 is a, is a really good example of that it's based on Virginia Woolf's Orlando which as you may know is about a, a man who becomes a woman across 300 years of history so it's the ultimate kind of gender bending kind of time bending story um, and within the ballet for the, the whole ballet is basically um, gender plasticity, men dressing as women, women dressing as men, men being men, men being women, um, everybody being androgynous. Um, so it's, it, it is really about, about people and what it means to be human. And of course, dance is incredibly well placed to sort of go beyond these sort of gender stereotypes um, because it's much more essential. There's something very immediate about how we communicate through the body. Um, and so it's able to communicate something of how we feel. We don't always, you know, we are in our bodies, we feel ourselves to be somehow entities within this body. We don't necessarily immediately, the, the first thing that comes to mind is necessarily our, our gender. And of course, gender is something that is now, is now fluid, which brings us right back to the question of what is a, what is a ballerina? 
uh, when we're talking about gender fluid dancers, it, it does a ballerina have to have been somebody who's born female? Is it somebody who has point shoes? Is it all of these things are being blasted open one by one um, and, and put up for questioning? It's like, what is a dancer? Am I a dancer or am I a person who dances? Mm. Mm. That's, a, that's a bigger conversation. <laughs> we have kind of gone around this, uh, in a circle in terms of the whole definition and perception of the, uh, the dancer. And with the last chunk, we have been looking at how far we've evolved and the sort of different questions that we're asking and the different um, perceptions that we have and, and myths that have been broken. Jane, as a curator of dance, uh, has there been anything particular that you've seen recently that's inspired you, that kind of is indicative of the evolution that we're talking about and wishing for or seeing? I don't know. I think that's actually very hard. I mean, I'm fascinated uh, by how different generations will dance in different ways. Um, I think also one's got to sort of look at the fact that through um, the media, one has so many more uh, moments. And I think this is true of quite a number of dancers to actually look at other dancers' interpretations uh, and draw on that. But I think also what we need to, to, to keep a, a control of is a sense of some of the things that we are losing. Um, and we're not losing them because they're not attractive. Um, and I have often sort of, I mean, I've always loved, for example, the choreography of August Bournemouth and the detail in the footwork. And now with stages being much larger and general movement being more expansive, things like that become more challenging, um, particularly, I think, when companies don't perform these things very often. I think that's one of the things is that, that, that whole sort of sense of it's, it's not just mounting ballets, whether old or new. It's giving the dancers the opportunity to work with the creators on a slightly wider scale so that the different techniques can be absorbed. And one of the things I actually love is seeing dancers master a whole range of different styles, not just I'm going to come in and do my party piece, which is actually also going back to the 19th century where ballerinas had their favourite um, uh, variation that they would bung into any ballet, um, <laughs> taking sometimes the music with them and sometimes getting music written to fit it. Um, and I think it, we're, sometimes we're in a bit of a danger of that now. Dancers, I'm going to put my tricks in whenever I can, if I'm allowed to. Um, so there's, and with the increase in galas as well, I think, and people traveling around and sort of vying with one another, that comes across as a bit too evident. Uh, I want large artistry. I want people who are really rounded and also that will bring personality to what they're doing. Not just, look at me, I'm a wonderful dancer. Look at me, I'm a wonderful artist. Do you know, Jane, can I also say that I think that the footwork, the emphasis on footwork was because the skirts were long. Yes. And the, what you could really see was from halfway down the calf to the end of the toes. So it had to be magnificent to make it interesting. As the skirts got shorter and shorter, so then you saw more and more leg, the technique evolves. Then when you're no longer in a tutu, the, you know, again, there's a very different kind of technique happening. Yes. Heaps and heaps and heaps of food for thought. And I <laughs> hope you have really found this to be an insightful conversation. Full credit to our amazing panel. So can we give them a round of applause, please? I'd like to thank you personally, Monica, Jane, Uzma, Sarah. It's been a real treat to have this conversation with you. Thank you all very much for joining us. Good night. <laughs>